the Department of Homeland Securities, DHS, Acting Secretary, Kevin Kalinan, hosted CNN's Chief Washington Correspondent Jake Tapper for a private, off-the-record meeting last month. On May 24, Kalinan had lunch at the agency's headquarters in Washington, D.C., with Tapper for an exclusive, off-the-record meeting, Breitbart News confirmed with two sources close to the administration. Breitbart News first reached out to DHS officials for comment on May 30 after learning of the private meeting. Days later, on June 1, a DHS spokesperson did not provide details of the meeting between Kalinan and Tapper, but said that agency officials engage with a variety of media partners. As a law enforcement entity, the public's trust is critical to the Department of Homeland Security's mission, a DHS spokesperson said. To maintain that trust, the department engages with a variety of media partners to respond to media inquiries and provide factual information about its critical and diverse missions. An administration official with knowledge of the off-the-record meeting told Breitbart News that Mkalinan is more concerned with ingratiating himself with other never-Trumpers who have always advocated for open borders. Another source with knowledge of the meeting said Mkalinan offered Tapper an unprecedented level of access and accommodation. What was discussed behind closed doors, we'll likely never know, but if I'm a member of the administration battling each day to counter the wall-to-wall -wall disinformation campaign of Tapper and the opposition party, this meeting is sacrilege, the source told Breitbart News. Since his presidential campaign, President Trump has ridiculed CNN for its coverage of his administration. Last year, in particular, Tapper cut off Trump's senior advisor Stephen Miller during an interview, Christian pastor Ryan Glisman, who is the brother-in-law of South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg, contends a glowing report on the 2020 White House contender and his husband Chasen is built on falsehoods. A partial transcript is as follows. Laura Ingraham, has your family ever had an issue with your brother and his husband, his lifestyle? Ryan Glisman, absolutely not. It couldn't be further than the truth. There has absolutely never been any amount of shunning him from the family. I love my brother dearly. I want the best for him. I want the best for Pete and this story, this narrative of the family Shunningham just couldn't be further from the truth. Ingraham, why would he make this up? Glesman, the way I see it, is in such a competitive, a very large democratic field of candidates, you need to have a story. I'm not going to cut down a mayor's role. I think a mayor's role is important. But, at the end of the day, if you only have the mayor role and you're going to the highest office in the country, you need to have a different story. Unfortunately, we came victim to that, our family, of having this rags to riches story be brought up about my brother's childhood and the past to gain political points in the polls, the way I see it. Ingraham, I'm sensitive to this issue of family coming out and commenting on other family members. Why don't you just pick up the phone and talk to either Pete or your brother-in-law? Why come on this show? I don't understand why you don't pick up the phone. Glesman, to be honest with you, I didn't sign up for this. The only reason I'm here is for the truth to prevail. If it was that easy, that would have already been done." A protester grabbed a microphone from Senator Kamala Harris, DCA, as the 2020 White House hopeful spoke on stage at Move On's Big Ideas Forum on Saturday. The incident occurred after Harris had finished detailing her pay equity proposal and was preparing to take questions from Move On Chief Public Affairs Officer Karen Jean-Pierre and former Obama White House aide Stephanie Valencia. A man in a dark t-shirt and jeans with a hair bun strolled onto the stage and swiped the microphone from the surprised California Democrat. Members of the audience shouted hey! While the protest was hauled away by security guards. Thank you so much, sir, for your big idea, but we want to make sure that we are able to get through this," one of the moderators, attempting to move the queue and a period along, said. It's okay, folks. It's okay. People have their own big ideas. The protester, whose name is reportedly Aiden Cook, told The Hill that he sought to press Harris on a much bigger idea before he was booted from the stage. The Hill reports. Direct Action Everywhere, BICS, an animal rights organization based in California, said in a statement that the man was an activist who wanted to call on Harris to support ordinary citizens rescuing animals rather than the factory farms that abuse animals. Wayne Cheung, the founder of the group, said that families of ordinary Americans are being endangered and whistleblowers who expose criminal violations are being targeted. The typical voter, especially in the Democratic Party, doesn't approve, so we're asking for the party to end its support for corporate big ag," he added. Barack Obama asserted that the United States was founded on inequality, 
despite the Constitution enshrining equality into the law. Obama said. You know Brazil just thinks the United States was founded on inequality and we have to admit that even though the United States has a constitution that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, at that time not only were blacks excluded, but women were excluded, and people who didn't own property were excluded. Obama commented on his understanding of the founding of the United States during the Tex Day 2019 conference in Sao Paulo, Brazil on Wednesday. Obama said that the Constitution gave America the means of inclusion through democracy. The more people we included, the more successful we became, he said. Obama used a basketball analogy to illustrate his point, pointing out that the NBA was better than ever by including more international players like Gianna Sentikounmpo, a Nigerian from Greece who plays for the Milwaukee Bucks. Now he's one of the best players in the world, Obama said, pointing out that if the NBA did not include international players, they were leaving talent on the field. If you don't include women, you are leaving talent on the field, Obama said, saying it was in every country's interest to include everyone. He admitted that perfect equality was difficult to achieve, because of natural talent and work ethic. The issue is not perfect equality, the issue is, are those of us who are successful willing to give back enough to provide a ladder of opportunity for others that are coming behind us, he said. Obama continued with a discussion about the wealthy, asserting after a family obtained enough money to eat, buy a house, send their kids to college, and take a vacation once in a while, additional financial wealth would not make people happy. He acknowledged that he now had more money than he ever had in his life, and claimed he could not spend it all if he tried. It's not money that is making me happy, but we teach ourselves that our measure of success is the more we have, the harder we hang on to it, the better we must be, the higher our status is, he said. Obama said that the concept of wealth and status in the United States was what made societies less equal. We have to redesign our minds to say that we're at our most powerful and influential when we're able to help others, he concluded. Obama clarified that he still supported the concept of capitalism but called for a revolution of values to create a better, more equal society that was more environmentally stable. It's not going to do us much good to have really wonderful apps and great virtual reality when the actual reality of the planet is getting hotter, and the oceans are rising, and the forests are getting cut down, and we can't breathe, he said. A recent Politico magazine profile outlined 2020 presidential hopeful Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's DNY, desperate attempts to garner donations and concern over how her gender appeals to voters. While she spoke at a micro-pub four miles inland from the Atlantic Ocean, Gillibrand told her supporters she needed financial assistance in order to be successful in the race for president. For anyone here, if you like what you've heard tonight, I want to earn my place on the debate stage. I can't do it unless you send a dollar, literally, really, Gillibrand said to a small crowd of supporters gathered in the pub. The measure is for anyone who wants to be on the debate stage, you need to get 65,000 individual supporters. So please go to KirstenGillibrand.com and just send a dollar. It will help me get to the debate stage. Gillibrand, the author of a New York Times bestseller who was once named one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world, also shared her concerns that gender plays a large role in who gets elected in the end. In a conversation for Politico's Off Message podcast, Gillibrand, according to Politico, vacillated between insinuating that she is being treated differently because of her gender and arguing that Americans are ready for a female president. Gillibrand said, Hillary won the election. She won the popular vote by 3 million votes, and you have to remember, she was definitely the most qualified candidate we'd ever had running for president. And, but for Russia, but for Comey, but for misogyny, but for a lot of things, she would have won. So, I believe that of course this country is ready to elect a woman president, but they need to know what we're running on and what we're for, and why we're running and why we think we're the best candidate. Politico questioned. How did it come to this? How did one of America's best financed senators come to rely on charity and presidential panhandling, begging for a dollar at a time just to stay alive? How did one of Washington's most recognizable women find herself buried in the polls beneath a number of less prominent men? And how does she breathe life into her campaign before it's too late? In an attempt to excuse her low polling placement, Gillibrand referred to former President Bill Clinton's polling as a presidential candidate claiming it takes time for candidates to become well-known and improve in polls. 
the last couple of presidential candidates who were Democrats who won, or even our nominees, you had to look at where they were at this early stage, Gillibrand stated. I think somebody looked up where Bill Clinton was at this stage. He had 1% in the polls and had 30% name recognition in Iowa. So, like, it takes time. And with 20 candidates, it might actually take longer, because for each one of us to have a chance to be heard, it's going to take time, added Gillibrand, who has yet to reach the required donor threshold. I mean, even the debates alone, if we get more than five minutes each on that stage, that'll be surprising. So, you're really even not even going to have more than a few minutes to talk about what you're for and why you're running and what your views are for the country, she said. When pressed on the worst part of running for president, Gillibrand said she does not like when reporters ask her about male colleagues. The one thing that's annoying to me is how many times reporters ask you about our male colleagues. Who cares? I'm running for president. I want to tell you what my vision is, why I'm running, and why I'm going to win, Gillibrand stated. I think reporters like yourself, who are super smart and super careful, will always ask me what I think about the male colleagues. Are you asking the male colleagues what they think about us? Probably not.